Hello, my name is Professor Matthew Schmidt and welcome to Genetics. In this session we're going to continue our exploration of gene expression and protein synthesis, specifically talking today about RNA molecules and RNA processing. We did discuss last time uh, the process of transcription whereby an RNA molecule is copied from a DNA template. So the point of today's session is to look more at specifically uh, what happens to the RNA under different circumstances, what needs to happen to it in order for it to be able to uh, send its message in the case of messenger RNA, etc. So one thing that I think is not emphasized sometimes enough, and it has to do with the general idea of processing here, but I want you to understand something before we even look at the processing part. All messenger RNAs, and this is probably true of other types of RNAs as well, but let's focus on the message. Whether it's in bacteria, eukaryotes, whatever, when the whole entire RNA molecule is released away from the DNA, in other words, it's complete, it's finished, not only does it have a coding region, okay, in other words, the part that actually has the information that's going to go and get translated into a a polypeptide, but it also has, so that's the coding region right there, but there's a five prime so-called UTR or untranslated region and that's located in this area and then there's a three prime, three prime UTR also at the other end. So these untranslated regions, I mean the, the name pretty much tells you what it is, they're untranslated so they're not carrying coding information from the DNA, but they're doing something else, uh, which we can discuss in a moment. Now there is one difference, well there are a lot of differences, but particularly in bacteria, once the messenger RNA, let's just assume we're talking about the message for a while now, it's mature and ready to be translated literally as soon as it's made. So in other words, this molecule that we're sort of diagrammed here, it's ready to go, it can interact with the ribosome and get translated, the part that's supposed to get translated. And remember, if you've been following along, we mentioned even that in bacteria, translation can start before transcription is even finished. These two processes are happening simultaneously in bacteria. In eukaryotes, on the other hand, the mRNA is immature when it's first transcribed and it's inside of the nucleus. So it's often referred to as a pre-mRNA during this time, and it's going to have to be processed in several ways before it can become a functional messenger RNA and leave the nucleus. So in the case of eukaryotes, for physical reasons, transcription and translation are separate, but also it's not just physical reasons. This mRNA is a lot different than the bacterial counterpart. Let's just go back for one minute to the bacterial one. Um, the 5' prime UTR and the 3' prime UTR, we're not going to go into great detail about what's going on there, but it seems like the 5' prime untranslated region have something to do with control of translation. And remember, this is whether it's in bacteria or eukaryotes, which is why I just want to mention it very quickly. In other words, it may play a role in guiding messenger RNA towards a ribosome. We're not going to get into a lot of detail. The three prime region seems to have to do with mRNA stability, and these are very generalized observations. But my point is, the coding region obviously is the thing that's bringing the information from the gene to get translated but there are regulatory aspects sort of built into this molecule. So how is it going to get translated? Um, how long is it going to stay around? Things like that are inbuilt into the messenger RNA, okay? Prokaryotes or eukaryotes. Now, in eukaryotes, however, several things have to occur, must occur, before this pre-mRNA is mature and ready to go, ready to go out to the ribosome and get translated. So let's take a look at a couple things that have to happen. First, at the 5' prime and the 3' prime end, at the very 5' prime end, excuse me, I wanted to do that, 
uh, capping has to occur. They call it a cap. So a modified G residue, which technically is called 7-methylguanosine, so it's a G, but this is a G with an addition that you won't see in any other place, has to be added to the 5' prime end of the RNA by a capping enzyme, and there have been several capping enzymes identified. But it's absolutely necessary for binding of the mRNA to the ribosome. And in fact, if there's any function, if there's any mutation that relevant capping enzymes, it's usually a lethal problem. Uh, this is also a little bit odd because we're adding something to a five prime end. Usually, when we're polymerizing nucleotides, they're coming onto the three prime end, right? So, for a couple of reasons, this is sort of sh different than what we've seen before. Also important is the addition to the three prime end of a so-called poly A tail. So poly A just means exactly what you would think. A lot of A or adenosine uh, residues are going to get added on there. Anywhere between 50 and 250, uh, average maybe 200. But So you get this long tail there. They're added to the end of the transcript. An enzyme called poly A polymerase, that's pretty fitting, is what adds them. And this is very interesting. This is the first time we're seeing it. It can add these string of A's onto the end of a RNA without any template. In other words, you don't need a corresponding U, 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 U to put it on. This enzyme has the ability to just to add A's over and over and over again. Now, the tail functions in regulating the messenger RNA stability and transport from the nucleus. So just um, we don't have to get into the details terribly, but don't get confused. Again, all messenger RNAs have the 5' prime and the 3' prime UTR, which certainly may have functions having to do with control and stability. Don't get that confused. In eukaryotes, the additional poly A tail is put on there, and there's evidence that, you know, obviously they wouldn't get put on for no function. So there's evidence that in eukaryotes, the poly A tail, for example, is important in regulating the stability. Maybe the 3' prime UTR also functions in eukaryotes, but it's a separate thing. Okay. Now, in addition, and this is, uh, when we talk about RNA processing, there are a lot of things going on, but splicing is probably the most interesting, and most people probably think about splicing when they think of RNA processing. Now, this only occurs in eukaryotes as well. In the late 1970s, a major discovery was made, and that it, the discovery specifically was this, that there was not, as had been assumed, strict collinearity, we use that term, and I'll make sure we understand it in a minute, between a mature, finished eukaryotic mRNA and the gene from which it was transcribed. So we've always said that, look, the sequence of DNA nucleotides, since the RNA is made from that, you would think the sequence of RNA nucleotides is collinear, one-to-one -one correlation between all of them, right? But it turns out that that is not the case with respect to eukaryotic mRNAs. So what you would see is something like this. If this was a mature mRNA in a eukaryote, they did experiments, and they said, let's take the DNA template that this came from and try and hybridize them together. You might expect there to be just like this, right? Assuming that you could get the, you can actually do this, get the single strand, uh, break the DNA up into single strands and just use the single strand to hybridize. If there was perfect collinearity, you would see this type of a structure, and they actually looked under the electron microscope. Much to many people's surprise, what was seen was something more like this with the DNA in blue. So there were parts that were collinear, but then you'd see these loops coming out. Okay? And the interpretation of the experiment was that these loops, obviously, so blue is DNA, red is RNA, that the DNA that was present in those loops, for whatever reason, did not make it. The sequence information in those loops did not make it into the mature messenger RNA. So what's now widely known and understood, but is what these type of experiments show you, is that it was determined that all eukaryotic genes 
are split by so-called intervening sequences. Now, these have taken on the name introns, and they have no coding information. It's not to say they don't have any function whatsoever necessarily. This is something that's a little bit still under debate, and it's becoming more and more understood. But they don't have regular coding information in the sense of leading to a protein being made. So uh, there are introns, and then the coding regions, which are expressed, which in my little picture here would correlate to these areas, right? So they are called exons. Exons, I believe, is for expressed information. So exons and introns are important terms to know. And in, if I can do it in my diagram here, I would write, okay, and make sure that this makes sense to you. The regions that are hybridized, that means the DNA information is in the messenger RNA. That's being expressed, so that's an exon. This loop is an intron number one. Here's exon number two, an intron number two, and exon number three. So in my little crude drawing here, there are three exons separated by two introns. Technically, I believe that the term intron is reserved for the, uh, the material that well, we're going to talk about it in a minute, but how could this happen? So in other words, in the pre-mRNA, before it gets spliced, this non-coding information is present, and that's the intron. I, in DNA, you probably should call it an intervening sequence. But in order for the mRNA to function, right, the introns have to be removed by the process called splicing. So I'm hoping that it's, it's clear to you, but what I'm saying is, there has to be a collinearity between the DNA and the messenger RNA when it's first produced. In the pre-mRNA, the introns are getting expressed, if you will. They're copied, but they have to be spliced out and before you get this mature uh, RNA. So they're going away in the process. That's what le led a lot of people to think, like, what's the point of these things? But that's a more philosophical discussion. So what happens? How, how does the splicing occur? Well, this is where you may remember them. The small nuclear RNAs come in, and these aren't all the small nuclear RNAs, but a specific set of them called the uRNAs, and they're U1 through U6, and a whole bunch of proteins. This might sound sort of familiar. I'm not saying it's the same in any functional way, but a bunch of RNAs and about 40 proteins We've seen that type of a structure before in the ribosome. This is called a spliceosome because of the same idea. It's a large uh, macromolecular assemblage of RNAs and proteins, and it functions sort of as a whole in order to make sure that splicing goes well. So during this time, uh, it's a stable particle. The spliceosome has RNA and protein. Now, People tend not to call the ribosome this next term that I'm going to, to tell you. But whenever you have a stable particle that's part RNA and part protein, and it needs both of them to function, it's often called a small nuclear, well, it's called a ribonucleoprotein. In this case, it's a small nuclear ribonucleoprotein because it's based on the small nuclear RNAs. Even though it totally doesn't make any sense, scientists like to call these things SNRPs, pronounced like this. If you really read it, it's like SNRNIP or something like that. SNRP sounds a lot better. So a SNRP, but this is a large uh, collection of molecules that work together. Now, depending on your class, you may go very deeply into the splicing process and machinery or not so much. So as usual, we'll try and take a middle ground here. But the U1 RNA is very important in recognizing a base sequence based on base pairing uh, at the 5' prime splice site, all right? So the 5' prime splice site, meaning the intron has a 5' prime and 3' prime end, just like all nucleic acid parts do. We have to cut it at the 5' prime end and the 3' prime end and get it out of there. So the U1 RNA recognizes the 5' prime splice site, and it's basically a guide and these proteins are part of the spliceosome, but you're going to need an endonuclease, which is a cuts, in this case, RNA internally, not from the end. So you're going to cut out at the 5' and the 3' end, 
And then you're going to need um, a ligase to glue, if you will, the two pieces of the relevant exons together. I'll show you a picture in a minute that I hope I hope this is making sense. But So the bottom line is that the intron, you know, there may be 10 introns, but at any given point, an intron is cut out and the two exons are joined together. Rejoined is technically not, I guess, correct, but what I mean is from the point of view of the mature messenger RNA, these sequences should be right next to each other, and that's how they have to end up. Now, specific DNA sequences are necessary at the junctions, the splice junctions, uh, sometimes called the donor sites, to ensure accurate positioning and cutting because it has to be exact. Just like we said transcription, it has to start exactly at plus one. You start messing up where the intron is getting cut out, that's really going to create serious, serious problems. So this has exquisite uh, specificity to it. Now, these sequences are generally conserved, meaning that in most organisms, the 5' prime and 3' prime uh, splice donor sites are similar, and that implies that this is a, an ancient and evolutionarily conserved process. But here are some absolute requirements. So in other words, if you memorize anything, this would be a good thing to memorize. And that is that at the beginning of the intron, so this is the boundary between the exon and the intron, it starts with GU here at the 5' prime end. And it at the 3' prime end, where the cut's going to be made, there's always an AG there. There's more to the conserved sequence, but that's what always occurs right at the borders, okay? And what's going to happen is we're going to cut here, we're going to cut here, we're going to join those two exons together. Now here's a little bit better picture, obviously, that I can draw. So in eukaryotes, let's think about messenger RNA processing sort of as a whole. So first at the DNA level, now here's the thing. In the DNA, there are exons, and as I told you, they're usually not called introns. They call them intervening sequences. But this is just a regular DNA double helix, right? The DNA is not concerned about the fact that some of this is going to get expressed and some of it isn't. Because in the primary messenger RNA um, that just come right off the DNA, all this information is going to be there, all right? Now, this piece in this piece of RNA, we're recognizing here's an exon, 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 here's an intron, and an intron. So our goal eventually is going to be to get rid of these introns and join the exons together in a seamless and smooth way. Now, sometimes you'll see this terminology differ. The term primary RNA basically means right off the DNA, okay? If you think of it in a stepwise fashion, after the cap, remember the 5' prime uh, G cap, modified G, and the poly A tail are put on, that happens first, and you have some people call that the pre-RNA because it's getting to be a uh, process and it's getting to be mature, but splicing still has to take place. So basically, you have a spliceosome here, and basically, one's coming to each of these two areas. We're getting cutting out the uh, intron area here and joining the exon so that in the mature RNA down here, if you could see the boundaries, I mean, of course you can when it's a nucleic acid going together, but you would see exon 1, exon 2, and exon 3 are now all joined together in a smooth thing that's going to ultimately be read, translated, as if those introns were totally irrelevant. And they are irrelevant to the coding aspect of this. They may have other functions, as we mentioned. So what this bottom line is trying to show down here, this bottom diagram, is that all of this processing, the capping, the tailing, the splicing, that all occurs inside of the nucleus, right? Only once the messenger RNA is completely processed, then it's going to be able to get out through one of the nuclear pore complexes and make its way to try and find a ribosome to be able to get translated. Remember, I know you know, but I just want to be very clear about this. In bacteria, there is no nucleus anyway. There's no need for processing. It's two separate ideas, but they sort of go together. 
bacteria do not have introns. So the messenger RNA that's made what we would consider like the primary mRNA or the pre-mRNA, that's it. And it's fine. It's going to go get translated. That makes, in a way, the most sense. Uh, this was very shocking when it was discovered that there's all these interruptions and uh, sequences in most of our genes that don't even get expressed. So my point is, th things can happen very quickly in bacteria. Um, part of the reason why their rate of growth is so, so fast is because they can get things like this done quickly. Uh, DNA, you know, metabolic things, DNA replication, etc. But my point is, so no processing is required in bacteria, and furthermore, there's no nucleus anyway, so transcription and translation can occur at the same time. Eukaryotes have sequestered the DNA in the nucleus, and for whatever reason, because we're not saying it right now, uh, that introns have to be removed, it's safe to do that in the nucleus and only to release a completely mature, ready-to-go um, messenger RNA out into the cytoplasm. So even if there was no splicing, in eukaryotes, transcription would have to be uncoupled or decoupled from translation because of the mere fact of the nuclear sequestration of the DNA, right? But as long as it's in there, it seems that eukaryotic cells have said, all right, well, let's take care of the mRNA processing in here. And once a, a messenger RNA leaves the nucleus, that's it. It's ready to go. All right. So a couple of other things that we have to uh, mention in this context is a term called heterogeneous nuclear RNA, HNRNA. So think about this. You could... Um, so let me put it this way. The entire population, let me put it this way because that's exactly what's written on the slide. The entire population of primary mRNA transcripts in the nucleus is referred to as HNRNA. And the reason is because there's all this variation in the sizes and the stage of processing that's going on because this is a, think about this, this is ongoing all the time. Maybe this gene got transcribed five minutes ago and this one got transcribed 10 minutes ago. One might be almost done being processed, one might be in the early stages. So that's why it's heterogeneous. There are RNAs at all these different stages. So if you were to just isolate bulk RNA from the nucleus of, of messenger RNA type, it would be heterogeneous in a lot of ways. So, and I also wanted to say, um, there's a reason we're focusing on messenger RNA. And that's because we're you know trying to understand this whole process by which information from the DNA ends up in a polypeptide, and mRNA is the carrier of this information. But let's also recognize that it's not just genes that are going to encode proteins that have introns. Also, transfer RNAs and ribosomal RNAs have introns in them too. So remember last time we had a new definition of the gene, which was a stretch of DNA that makes a functional RNA product. Now, that RNA product may be a messenger RNA, but it might be a tRNA, an rRNA, or a small nuclear RNA for that matter. All right, so these genes have introns in them as well. Um, only mRNAs get the cap and the poly A tail. So I guess you, you should say all RNAs are generally spliced. mRNAs need the cap and the tail. And that sort of implies that those things are specifically having to do with the informational aspect of a messenger RNA. All right. Now, we're not going to go into the details, but the mechanism of splicing is different for tRNAs and rRNAs. It is understood, but mostly if you're ever asked or if it's discussed in your class, they'll be talking about the splicing of a messenger RNA. Very, very fascinatingly, if that's a word, some introns are self-splicing, and I bring this up because it's interesting in this context, but also because it led, it was sort of part of a series of experiments that led to an amazing discovery. So tetrahymena is a protozoan single-cell creature that was never famous before this happened. It was discovered that one of its RNAs, uh, in particular, it was the 28S, the large ribosomal RNA, no spliceosome was needed for it to get, it has introns in it, 
but no spliceosome was needed to get the introns out. And in fact, they were able to do experiments using proteases, enzymes that digest proteins, to show that no proteins at all were necessary for intron removal. A lot of people did not believe this for a second because clearly enzymatic activity is necessary to cut uh, RNA, right? Or, or to do anything in terms of uh, molecular biology, it was thought. So this discovery, once it was figured out what was going on, um, I'm really interested in this area, but I think everyone admits that it is revolutionary uh, in terms of our understanding of biochemistry as well as genetics, because what it showed was that it's not the norm. But what I mean is, we have found many examples of this, but we believe that it's probably some kind of a, an artifact from a time when RNA was much more doing many more functions than it does today. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So RNA itself can be enzymatic. I don't know if this is the first time that you've ever heard that, but it's very, very, very exciting. Um, it was thought for forever before this that only proteins had enough structural you know ways they could fold and things like that in order to be enzymes well this RNA catalyzes the removal of the introns inside of itself let me say that again so you have this RNA with introns in it that have to be removed the way it folds up it acts as an enzyme so that it can cut the introns out of its own self and catalytic RNAs have been have come to be known as ribozymes. That's a great name, right? An enzyme made of ribonucleic acid, a ribozyme. And these, it's not the only evidence, but this is strong evidence that RNA preceded DNA in an evolutionary fashion. And I don't know if this is uh, something that you've heard a lot about, but there's a whole idea that there was an RNA world and RNA metabolism existed before there was probably even cellular life. So if you're interested in this, there's some great articles. I wrote one once. But uh, this RNA world is exciting, but it's not really where we need to go here. So catalytic RNAs have been found in all sorts of organisms. They're relatively abundant. I wouldn't say, you know, out of all enzymes, certainly most of them are proteins. But the fact that this was not just an isolated incident shows that, yeah, RNAs can be enzymes too. So now, unfortunately, like in the early bio classes, they will make statements like proteins or enzymes. That's it. Don't worry about the rest. So now you know ribo, uh, well, RNAs may be enzymatic, may be catalytic. Now, in the case, I'm sorry, I just wanted to mention one more term. So this is sort of auto... The, the term, I mean, it's interesting in that it, there are a lot of RNA enzymes. I'm sorry, let me just hit pause for a minute in my brain. What I'm trying to say is that there are RNA enzymes that come and act on another molecule. This tetrahymena ribosomal RNA is amazing because it's autocatalytic. That's the word I was looking for. In other words, it acts on itself. It folds up the enzymatic actions of it remove the introns. So all you need there is the RNA. It makes sense evolutionarily, right? That that would be a lot simpler than needing spliceosomes and all sorts of proteins and things like that. Autocatalysis, excellent stuff. Now, we're gonna finish off this part by looking at tRNA structure. And the reason I wanted to sort of segue this into uh, translation is because I once had made the statement in the last uh, session that tRNA, in my mind, is the decoder molecule. And the structure of it is very important in understanding how it acts to decode. So if you can understand this, you'll get a first idea of how translation actually works. Now, first of all, tRNA structure. All transfer RNAs are strikingly similar in their structure, both secondary and tertiary. They're all relatively about the same size. They're small, relatively small, 75 to 90 nucleotides, right? And they fold into what's uh, generally known as a clover leaf secondary structure. Just let me show it to you for a minute so you get the idea. So 
you know, I don't know if I were to call this a clover leaf, but it's the idea that there's three. Sort of like most clovers are three leafed clovers, right? A four leaf clover is supposed to be lucky. Well, you only get three in transfer RNA. But the point is, look, this is one piece of RNA. Here's the five prime end, right? Here's the three prime end. It's folding back on itself extensively. So in other words, these structures here, these are like the hairpin loops that we've mentioned before. Um, you have four stems here, but only three loops because this is the beginning and end of the molecule. But that's what they mean by a cloverleaf secondary structure. And well, of course, there are some variations. Every tRNA has this same general folding pattern. So in that sense, they're all very, very similar. Now, x-ray diffraction is a, sorry, is a process that we've mentioned, I believe we have mentioned it, um, that's often used to get at protein tertiary structure. RNAs are sort of hard to crystallize, but it has been done with transfer RNAs, and we have been able to know the exact three-dimensional structure of several transfer RNAs. Um, they are somewhat L-shaped. Um, I don't have a, a great, great picture of this, but they say that the helices get stacked. So there are four helices in that clover leaf, which we'll look at again in just a second, and they stack. So that's secondary structure, but you may not have ever thought of this. There's a tertiary structure to RNAs. They all fold in three dimensions. Now, I, I know everything's in three dimensions, but DNA, for the most part, its secondary structure is the most important thing. There is sometimes some higher order folding of it, but I like RNA a lot better than DNA. It can do a lot more things. Two very important functional regions on the tRNA, a CCA acceptor stem. That's at the three prime end, and that's where an amino acid attaches. This is why it's the decoder molecules, you, guy, you guys. Let me rephrase that. This is why it's the decoder molecule, you guys. Sorry. Uh, an amino acid, remember the whole point of this process of translation that we're going to get to is to take something that's in nucleotide language and put it into protein language, in other words, amino acid language. So an amino acid gets attached to this tRNA very specifically at, it's always CCA is the sequence there, acceptor stem, what does it accept? It accepts an amino acid. There's an anticodon loop involved in mRNA recognition. So it's almost as if part of this molecule knows how to speak RNA language, part of it knows how to speak protein language, and that's how it's the decoder. This is something, this last point, you could talk about quite a bit. Uh, I don't really want to because you probably don't want to either, but um, it's worth knowing that modified nucleotides exist in tRNAs, sometimes a lot of them. So you can look them up if you want. Inosine, for example, is a modified nucleotide. If you look up its structure, it's very similar to a, quote, regular base, but it's a little bit different. And it's thought that because, hopefully this will make sense, because tRNAs all have the same general shape, um, some of these modified bases and their positioning may be important in recognition and differentiation of these very similar transfer RNAs. So let's finish up just by looking at, again, at this picture of the uh, transfer RNA and look at structurally the important parts. So here's the anticodon loop, the part that speaks RNA language, because this is what I mean. Here's a messenger RNA down at the bottom here. And there's a certain sequence here that has three U's in a row, right? Because of the base pairing rules, three A's would be attracted to that, right? So in this case, the anticodon of this particular messenger, sorry, of this particular transfer RNA, its AAA anticodon will only bind with a, a UUU codon. We haven't used the word codon. But that's the triplet sequence in a messenger RNA that's red. I'm getting a little ahead of ourselves now. All right? Then any tRNA, we'll say a little oversimplification here, but it's true. Any tRNA with an AAA anticodon loop also has the amino acid phenylalanine stuck onto it. So we're going to talk about in the next session, uh, sorry, UUU in a messenger RNA 
means phenylalanine. This is the genetic code, and we'll be discussing that in an upcoming session. Now, when I said that a three-dimensional RNA looks like an L shape, it sort of looks like that. You guys know I'm not the greatest artist. Looking at it, it looks actually like a little small R to me, but I guess it's an upside down L. But I wanted, it, it's not necessarily easy to understand how the clover leaf folds up into this L shape. Uh, two of the helices stack on top of each other to make, um, I don't remember the exact ones, to make sort of one area, and then two stack on each other to make the other area, and there's a twist in there. But very importantly, the CCA acceptor stem ends up there, and the anticodon ends up down here. So they really are at two ends of the molecule, whether you look at it in the secondary structure or in the tertiary structure. Now, I hope you can see, just without worrying about any of the details, that if this messenger RNA down here, remember, what does the messenger RNA have in it? It has information from the gene, from the DNA, that somehow we're going to try and make that information into a protein, right? If you can understand this, you're not going to have a problem with translation, I really think. My point being, here's a sequence, U, 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 on the messenger RNA. It, it makes sense, I hope, that if a tRNA was going to come over there, it would have to have the sequence AAA, right? And it just so happens that all tRNAs with AAA have the amino acid phenylalanine on them. So this is how certain nucleotides in an RNA can mean a particular amino acid. And we're going to talk about the genetic code in the next session. I look forward to seeing you then.